All right, everybody. So let's, let's talk about today. Last week, we talked about who is Jesus. And today, we're continuing with that theme. And what's so amazing is there's some significant prophecies about Jesus that are spoken 800 years before he even came. And they are so specific and so on point. And not, even, not only that, but the timetable even works. It's astounding. And so today what I'm going to want to do is I want to be able to explain some of that to you. It's going to be a little heady, so hang on, okay? And also we're celebrating Palm Sunday. Today, Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem. He went public with the fact that he was a Messiah. He set enough things up. He set enough parameters up that when he was going to go, his disciples could continue on. Now he says he's the Messiah. He makes a grand entrance, and five days later, he's killed. Why? Because they could not stand what was going on. So that's today. But have you ever noticed that things are different than they look? Today is Jesus' uh, today prophecy. How many like dogs? Okay. How many like cats? Okay. You know, dog spelled backward is God. Seriously, dog. Backward is God. Guess what cat is backward? Satan. Anyhow, so <laughs> we, we like dogs, but I heard a number of years ago, there, there was a man that went up to someone that had a cute dog like this. It says, excuse me, sir. He wanted to pet his dog. He said, does your dog bite? He goes, no, my dog does not bite. So he tries, he t- pets the dog, and the next thing you know, rawr, it bites him. And he goes, wait, minute, sir, I thought you said your dog does not bite. He goes, that's not my dog. <laughs> so if you're getting bit here in church, it's not the church, it's the other person. No. But all kidding aside, there are people that don't understand the faith. And what has happened is people have their own ideas of who God should be. And when he doesn't end up being what they think, they reject him. And that's what kind of happened on Palm Sunday. You see, the Israelites, especially the religious leaders, had an idea of what was going to happen. Let me give you a little bit of a backdrop here. This would be the Mount of Olives, where Jesus came down on a donkey. As a matter of fact, we had a, a trip back in 2019 where we actually took a tour. We actually walked down and saw Jerusalem. And by the way, this is the Mount of Olives. Uh, and then we also went to the place where Jesus, uh, um, the place of the garden, Garden of Gethsemane as well, which is extraordinary. Anyhow, and so this is Jesus looking at the city, uh, and there was the Herod's temple that was right over here, and he would walk down from here, and he was going to take a donkey in. And so that's what happened, and it was a, pro- a procession that was prophesied over. And so we're going to look at it. And what's so amazing, people ask the question, well, how can one moment people say, blessed be the name of the Lord, and the next moment they say, crucify him? How could they go from one to the other in five days? And people say, well, people are fickle. And it's true, people are fickle. But you're going to find something else out today as well. I don't know if you realize this. I didn't know this, but I found this out a number of years ago. The reason why Jesus, why one moment they're saying, hail the king of the Jews, and the next moment they say, crucify him, is because they had illegal trials at night. The religious community of that day did not like what was happening. And so what they wanted to do, they arrested Jesus at night when people went to bed. And by 3 o'clock in the morning, they had things wrecked up. And and by 9 o'clock, he's already on the cross. People are just having their morning coffee. There's still a Starbucks in the line. and, And he's on the cross. So that was a situation that took place. And so it was an illegal trial. So the people were not as fickle as you think. The religious leaders used deception and secrecy to get him on the cross. And that's kind of what happened. Well, let's look at the scriptures today and see what happened. In John 12, 12 through 19, this is what happened to Jesus on on Palm Sunday, which we celebrate today. The next day, the news was on the way. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors, what Passover was a time where they celebrated the deliverance of the Israelites from the angel of death. Okay, I just want to explain for a few moments. One of the last plagues when Israel was in captivity in Egypt, there was a monumental time before they were out of Egypt They had to put the Passover lamb on the lentil of the door at the top and the two sides like a cross. And when the angel of death came over, what would happen was it would not kill the firstborn. 
Hence, we get the word Passover because of the blood, okay? And so that was the Passover lamb. And so the Israelites got out of Egypt. They went into the wilderness for 40 years. God raised up a deliverer by the name of Moses to do that. Then Joshua rose up, and then they began to go into the promised land. And they began a, a kingship uh, with Saul and then King David. They built a temple, okay? And that's what began to happen. And all through that time, and after, then after their rebellion, they were taken into captivity. And there were prophets that wrote about the coming Messiah, both prior to their captivity and after. So that's what happened, okay? I, I hope you're tracking with me. I want to make sure no one, I don't want to assume anyone knows all the uh, history here. So uh, a large crowd of Passover visitors took the palm branches and went down to the road. That's why they did that. Hail to the king, right? They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling a prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt, which means peace. If he came on a horse, he'd be conquering king. He did not come as a conquering king. He came as to inaugurate a time of peace for people's hearts. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy, but after Jesus entered into glory, they understood that. Listen, everybody, even right now, we think we understand what God is doing in your life. Sometimes you don't know what God is doing in your life until you look years later. Have you ever found that out? Yeah, Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, said the following, I am so glad that God did not answer my prayers, because if he would have, I would have married the wrong man several times. Sometimes we don't understand God's timing. God, why is this going on? But when you look back later on and you see God's provision, you see what's happening. These people had an idea of how God was going to come, how the Messiah was going to come. They thought it was going to happen in one big phase. And Jesus came in sections. He came in a phase one and a phase two is going to happen. And they didn't understand that. And so be very careful today with biblical prophecy. Sometimes we have it all figured out that if we're not careful, we could persecute a move of God because of our theology. And that's what was happening back then. They had their own ideas of how Christ was going to come. And when God changed what they thought, they were offended. Be very careful with that's what happened. So what happened is he went through this. And the reason why is because Lazarus was risen for the dead. We'll save time. We're not going to go through it all right now. But he went out and they said, hail to the king of kings. And they let down their... Uh, their coats and their palm branches and the religious leaders were irate. What are we going to do now? Everyone's going to him right now. Uh, Lazarus was risen from the dead because Jesus prayed for him and he came back from the dead. And they look, we're done. We got to take this guy out before his popularity gets greater. If his popularity gets greater, we're going to lose our clout. We're going to lose our standing within the Jewish community and our favor with the Roman government. Therefore, we got to get rid of this guy because he's taking away our power. Be very careful when your power and when your own ideals in your mind and your own desires sometimes can be so great that we begin to persecute what God is trying to do in our lives because we don't want to give up power. And it happens all the time. They were more in love. They were more in love with their own ideas about God than they were God himself. And that's what happened. So less than five days later, what happens? They yell at him. They, they kill him, crucify him. We just mentioned the fact that they had illegal trials. That's why they had a rental mob. And by the time it was early in the morning, most of the people that said, Hail, King of the Jews, most of the people that said, oh, Blessed be the Messiah, they didn't even know what was going on. By the time they woke up and had their morning coffee, it was too late. He was on the cross. And the enemy works in secret with deception and lies. That's what they did. Deception and lies, right? Using the bait of self-interest. Self-interest, what's in it for me, fueled with fear, paranoia, and arrogant speculation leading to conspiracy of evil. Now, that didn't happen the last three years, did it, everybody? There was no conspiracies going on, right? No one had their own ideals. 
you know. And so this is what can happen. Be very, very careful. The enemy is very trickery. Make sure you gather the facts that you know what you're talking about. Make sure you're submitted to God above your own thoughts and your own feelings. And this is what can happen through that. So all of this, by the way, about Jesus coming to Jerusalem, it was all prophesied about Jesus 500 to 800 years before it even happened. So what we're going to do right now, we're going to look at one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. His name is Daniel. And Daniel was in captivity. What happened was this. Uh, Israel had a, had a kingship. They had three kings. I mean, sorry, they had three kings before the divided kingdom. They had King David. I'm sorry, King Saul. Then you had King, I'm sorry, <laughs> King Saul. King David was the second king. Then you had Solomon, the third king. Then after that, because of what happened, the kingdom was divided. You had Judah, okay? And, and you had Judah and you had Israel, two different tribes, two different kingships. And through a period of time, what happened? Because of their rebellion, God allowed the Babylonians to take them captive. And finally, even God's city was overthrown by the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, and they took all these wise people, including Daniel, who was one of the upper echelon, the most educated. They educated him, and he was in not only the Babylonians, but under also the Persians as well with the Cyrus. So he was there all his life, and he was the second in command with Cyrus. So he worked within that culture. He never compromised his faith. But he honored the authority that was around him. He didn't curse the king. He blessed the king, but he stood his ground. My friends, that's how you and I should interact with our culture. We are to bless our culture. We are to bless, our, bless the, our, those in authority, but we're to do it with respect, and we're to stand our ground and not back down either. But do it with respect. And so Daniel's a great lesson, by the way, of how to intersect with a pagan culture, and that's exactly what he did. So he, so what happened is this, he is now 80 years old and he's reading about Jeremiah. Jeremiah says that Israel will be in captivity for 70 years. All right. The Bible often uses seven as a number when you say, okay. And that's what it was, 70 years. And the reason was they disobeyed the word of the Lord. I don't have time to get into it right now, but it was 70 years. It was getting close to the 70th year mark. And, and, and Daniel is praying and he's looking at the scriptures and seeing the prophetic words. And you know God's word will come true. And he's like, God, I don't see how this is going to happen. How are we going to go back after 70 years? So he's praying and asking God and he's fasting and he's praying. And then all of a sudden he has an angelic visitation from the angel Gabriel. And there's three archangels mentioned in scripture. One is Gabriel, one is Michael, and the third one is Lucifer, the enemy. Those are only three archangels mentioned. And what happens is Gabriel comes to him and he's praying. But a, a time went on and the Bible says, as soon as you began to pray, God heard you. So don't give up on your prayer. So this is what happens. We get to this passage of scripture. Okay. Uh, in Daniel, we're going to look at it in a few moments. There's two passages of scripture we're going to look at. But I also want to encourage you to understand biblical prophecy. There's a couple of things I want to help you understand. In biblical prophecy, there are basically two things that are mile markers or there's situations or uh, places, placeholders that take place. Let, let me explain. There are two main ways to understand biblical prophecy and the coming of Christ and all that is simply this. The Jewish people and the holy city Jerusalem. These are the two things that are spoken about all the time, about the Jewish people and the holy city Jerusalem, the nation. And when you see there was um, the first destruction of the temple of Babylon, then they came back and they rebuilt it. Then it was destroyed a second time. And then Herod, who was a Roman and partly Jew, helped build a third temple, which was the time of Christ. And then it was destroyed again in 70 AD. And it's prophesying there'll be another temple. Which, by the way, they have all the things ready to go, including the heifers, the red heifers. It's pretty amazing. But that's for next week. I'll let Pastor Randy talk about that next week. That's a joke. Okay, all right. So what happens with biblical prophecy often is this. The prophet Daniel sees his present age. He sees, the, he sees the, the, the king coming, and then he sees the future. And, and, and whoever it could be, they see all the peaks of the mountains, but they don't see the time in between. So right now, we're in this time. We're in the valleys of the time of Christ and the future. 
the second coming of Christ. That's where we are right now. And there's time in between here, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Now, what's so interesting is this. History is God's history is his story. All right? And God's timetable is different than ours. We measure our time through the calendar. We measure through the lunar lights, right? We have 24 uh, hours a day, 360 days a year. Uh, in the time of Jesus, they, they actually had 360 days a year instead of 365. And, and so we, we count time a various way. But God's time is different. In many ways, what happens is how many of you have to go running? If you go running at the track and you hit lap, you put your stopwatch on, and then once you finish one lap, what do you do? You hit the timer again, it goes back to zero, and then you run the next lap. And then you, you finish the lap, you hit the timer again, you do the third lap. That way you can see how you're running each lap. It's the timer in your lap. So it's almost like a sands, uh, sands of time. You put it over, it finishes, you go to the next one. So what happens in history is you have the prophecies of, of, of the Messiah, then history takes place, then Christ comes. So now the second part of the stopwatch is hit and time begins to happen. Then Christ dies and risen again from the dead and now we're in this part here and eventually the third time period is going to begin. And what's so interesting is uh, that the Bible in the book of Daniel actually gives times and sequences where you can actually figure out the first time Jesus came. Not quite the second time, because every time something happens, the stopwatch begins. So when a certain period happens, when they build the temple the second time, stopwatch is hit. And then time goes by, then Christ comes, and then there's a destruction of the temple, stopwatch is hit again. And now we're waiting for the third act. We're not quite sure when it's going to happen at this point. So let me go ahead and show you what I'm talking about, okay? Jesus talks about that. Now, Jesus prophesies. He is the fulfillment of prophecy. Are you all tracking with me so far? Okay. And so, so Isaiah wrote about what was the ministry of the Messiah. And Jesus, when he begins his public ministry, actually goes to the synagogue around Galilee, which we went to in our tour of Israel. Amazing. And he actually read the passage. Now, I want you to pay attention here, okay? Here we go. Here's Jesus. He reads the passage from the book of Isaiah. He says the following. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus speaking here. He's reading the, the prophetic um, scriptures. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery to the sight of the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then we jump to verse 21. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What scripture is fulfilled in your hearing? The one he just read. Okay, you follow me? So this so is what he does. So in Isaiah 61 2, this is the part that Jesus reads. Here's the last part of that prophecy. Jesus reads this part. He says this, all right? He says this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He sh closes, he shuts the scroll. In other words, he stops reading and he sits down. Instead of, he doesn't put a period, he puts a comma. He does not read this next part of the prophecy because he's fulfilling the first half, not the second yet. Look what he says. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and this is the part he did not read. That's on purpose. And the day of vengeance of our God, which did not come yet. So Jesus does not read that. He reads the first section of it. That first hourglass has been turned over. And now he's saying, this is the part for that. But he's not talking about a second coming. Hence, the problem with the disciples. We believe, there's enough evidence to believe, the reason Judas betrayed Christ because Jesus was going against what he thought he should do. They were looking for a conquering king. Even after Jesus rose again from the dead, his disciples asked him in the book of Acts, are you going to now set up your kingdom? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and the epochs the Father has put in place, but this is what you are to do. Go throughout the world and preach the gospel. 
So even the disciples were so hell-bent on the messianic prophecies that they thought it all happened at once, but it happened in stages. Like the mountains I saw. Remember the Solomon Mountains where the guy sees the tops of the, uh, he sees the pinnacles, but he doesn't see the valleys in between? So isn't it interesting that Jesus stops at that, at that comma? Okay. All that being said, I want to now share with you Daniel's prophecies. Okay, this is a little controversial, but it's amazing. And I'll show you. I'm going to read from a, a more modern translation. They do a good job with it. So here we go. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. Remember, everybody, he knows about Jeremiah. He knows that Christ is going to come. He knows, excuse me. He knows that what's going to happen is they're going to get back from captivity because they've been in captivity almost 70 years. And he's like, God, you said, and he's praying for the fulfillment of the promise. And I encourage you to do the same thing. When you pray, God, I'm praying for my family. Give my life to the Lord. Lord, I'm praying for this job. Continue to pray. Continue to ask. Keep knocking. Keep seeking. Until the Lord says otherwise. Keep praying. And that's what he was doing. And so now he's, he's actually giving a, uh, an ex explanation what took place to him. Okay? So here we are. He's praying now. Very, very. He's praying passionately to hear the answer. Okay? So here we go. Daniel chapter 9. So I went on praying and confessing. My sin and the sins of my people. My friends, if you and I are going to intercede for anybody, make sure you pray for your own sins because all of us without God are a wreck. The moment you and I start looking like this, I have it together and they don't, is the moment God goes like this. Can't deal with this person. They're proud. But when you and I recognize if it was not by the grace of God, none of us could stand that I am a saint with a sin problem and I need God every single day. The closer I get to God, the more I need God. That's the attitude you and I should have. We're not better than anyone else. It's by God's grace. And that's the kind of attitude Daniel had. All right? So praying, confessing the sin of me and, and my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. Okay? Very important. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me in the time of the evening sacrifices. By the way, you know when the evening sacrifice was? At 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Guess when Jesus said it is finished? At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the evening sacrifice on the day of Passover. That's when Jesus was the final lamb. It is, is the evening sacrifice. Very interesting. So this is what happened. Gabriel, who I have seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. And by the way, at the time of the evening sacrifice, there was no temple. But Daniel still kept the tradition of the evening sacrifice. Now listen to this as we move forward here. A period of seven, a period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people. Okay. A period of 70 sets of seven, which is actually 49, has been decreed by your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion. So in other words, they're going to finish their rebellion. What happened? They rebuilt the temple. Okay. Exorcist actually gave them permission to rebuild the temple. And Nehemiah was there. It took 49 years to build the temple and put the walls up. And it was established again. Not to the same glory it was but in the past. So that happened historically. And I believe at that point, that's when the stopwatch began again. The lap was finished, click. Now they're running, however long it takes to run there, now they got to that point, they hit the reset button, now the clock's going. Are you tracking with me, okay? So, to, so here we go. Seven sets have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sins, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness to confirm the prophetic vision and to, the, to anoint the most holy place. Now, listen and understand seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time of the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay? Exorcist actually did that. It was actually commanded to give. And if you do the math, I don't have time to tell you right now. I'll tell you in a few moments. So once it was rebuilt again and the city was ready to go, this is what it says. You see that, everybody? You follow me? Okay. So seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. How many are you completely confused? Okay, good. 70 sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time of the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. So that the stopwatch is hit. Until a ruler, 
the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? The Messiah. That's actually, you can translate it, that the Messiah comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses, which it was. When Jesus came, they was rebuilt, despite the perilous times. Even though they, they made the, sec- the Herod's temple was there, it was still perilous times, but it will, be, it will be rebuilt, and it was. Okay? After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one would be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. So basically he said, he'll be cut off. That's what it actually said. He'll be cut off. So the Messiah will come. It will seem like he's a colossal failure. I don't want to follow a failing Messiah. That's why people said, I don't want anything with Jesus. I want a conquering king. Okay? And so it would seem like it's a colossal failure. He'll come in and be cut off. Jesus seems like the Messiah comes. He's cut off midstream. Right? Appeared to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. So what happens is he's cut off. Jesus even prophesies and says, you see all these stones that are here? They're all going to be turned and and destroyed. And so what happens is in 70 AD, Titus comes in. He had enough of the Jewish people rebelling. And they rip the entire terrorist temple is torn apart. Every stone is turned around. The, the Jews are, are spread again. They're, they had enough of their rebellion, and they destroyed the temple. The sacrifices stopped happening. They have not had sacrifices in the temple since 70 AD. So that time clock stopped. And now we're waiting for the next time clock to hit. The lap time has been hit, and now they're still, we're still running. We're still waiting for that runner to come, the runner of history to come. And when a certain time comes, it's going to hit the stopwatch again, which is amazing. So, in Daniel 9.24, it says this. And now, it goes on. Okay, let me, let me explain. It talks about this. It talks about the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. That's what happened to Christ, right? And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple, which happened in 70 AD. Now, those are the, six, those are, um, those are the, those are the 69 weeks there's still one week left in the prophetic vision. And that happens at the end, to, ends of time. I'm not quite sure if the stopwatch has been hit yet or not. I don't think it has yet. But it's very significant that in 1948, the word of God says, can a nation be birthed in a day? And it actually was. The United Nations, after World War II, a, Israel became a nation in 1948. Then in 1967, in the Six-Day War, they recaptured Jerusalem. Now, they don't have, they have occupation of it. They let the Muslims still go in there with a dome on the rock. The capital's still in Tel Aviv, but they recaptured. So some people think. Jesus says, uh, says, Jerusalem will be trotted under the feet of the Gentiles until the end comes. So, the prophetic time clock, remember? We talked about the people of Israel and the temple and, and, the, and the city. We see it happening. But the temple has not been rebuilt yet. I, I'm not going to get into these different theories because I'm not going to. It's very interesting. Let's be very careful that we don't get hung up on these little things. It's, it's okay to look at theories and people are saying, well, we found the real city of David. We found where the temple was. It's not by the Dome of the Rock. The city of David was more in the, over here and his palace was over there. Therefore, we found the actual place where the, where the uh, temple really was. And it's, written, it's not in the wrong place. So they want to start rebuilding it. They're getting the red heifers again. All the, uh, all the equipment's being made and all that. It's ready to go. So I don't know how that's all going to work out, but we can sit here with conspiracy theories and drink coffee, too much coffee, and listen to all these webcasts and podcasts and get crazy. Don't get crazy. Focus on the main thing. Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the epochs the Father has sent, but this is what you are to do, spread the gospel. So that's our main emphasis. But we do need to be aware of what's going on. And we're entering an age where we're, all, the, all the things are being lined up, everybody. It's like everything's being set. There's, there's a very few things left to be set. This gospel shall be preached, and then the end shall come. So almost the whole world is getting closer to hear the gospel. So, and then after this, after you have, after you have these 69 weeks, here comes the 70th week, which we have not hit yet. After this period of 62 sets of seven, 
The anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. We talked about that. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the temple. The end will come with a flood and a war, and miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. Now, we're not there yet now. This is another time we have not hit yet. This is the 70th week. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven, but after half of this, after three and a half years, there's going to be a treaty of peace. So, you want to see what's going to happen? Look at the Middle East. Why is it that the whole world is fascinated with the Middle East? Right? You can't solve the issue. So watch what happens in Israel. That's why we are to pray for Israel. We're to pray for our brothers and sisters. We pray they come to know Jesus, their Messiah. He will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. So apparently there's another temple that would be built. And as a climax to his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilege object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out. Now, what's very interesting, history repeats itself. I, I, I can't get into all right now, but even in the, in the previous times, there was desecrations of the temple. In 70 AD, apparently 1.1 million, some people believe this, 1.1 million Jews were killed during that sack of Jerusalem. It was a bad, bloody time. So uh, I don't want to get into all this, but I want to show you what happens after. We're not there yet. We just talked about the 69 weeks. There's a 70th week coming. Now, look what Jesus has to say in Luke 19.41, and not, not the year, the scripture place. Luke 19.41 says this, Now as he, wrote, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Jesus is crying over, over Jerusalem saying, if you had known, if you had known, even you especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you on an every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. Jesus is prophesying 70 A.D., where some scholars think 1.1 million Jews were killed. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. They didn't know the time of their visitation. Now, what's so interesting is, remember Christmas? With the, uh, we, the king of Orient, remember the three wise men? There was more than three. They came from Babylon area. Some people believe they understood Daniel's writings and did the math of the anointed one, and they had an idea. Some people think that, again, this is something, that, not something you, this is something that's interesting, but we don't make theology out of it. You follow me? So what's so interesting, and also, how about this? How about Simeon? Simeon was in the temple. Jesus was brought to the temple when he was a baby, eight days old, and Simeon was told, you will not die till you see the Messiah. I believe Simeon knew, that, knew Daniel's prophecies. I think he understood what was happening. In the Qumran community, this is the Dead Sea Scroll people, they even counted all this up. And I, I personally believe John the Baptist had an idea as well. So they, they understood this. So we can get an idea. We can get an idea the season's coming. I believe we're heading very fast under the end times. And we, the stopwatch might begin again. But let's not persecute the move of God because we're fascinated and fixated with our own theory of the end times. We have to hold on to the main purpose of the end times. That's Jesus Christ, that we love him, are passionate for him, are ready to meet him in any moment, and we're to spread the gospel. That's our job. In the war room of heaven, they have all the plans. We don't know the plans. Remember, in the military, they call it need-to-know basis. The soldiers don't know what's going on. They're just told what to do. That's what we should do. But we should be aware of some timetables. And we are heading very close, I believe. Things are set up. It wouldn't take much for the clock to start again. When, that treaty, when you see a temple being rebuilt and all that, look out. So, you guys tracking with me? Okay, now, this, that's amazing. Now, I'm going to show you something that, that's indisputable. This is absolutely amazing. What I'm ready to show you is perhaps the greatest prophetic utterance of Christ, the most, the most prolific and the most dramatic prophecy you can find in Scripture in regards to Jesus is found in Isaiah 52 and 53. 
Psalm 22 is pretty amazing too when Jesus actually quotes it. But I want to show you something here. This is going to describe what's going to happen this coming week, what's called the Passion Week. This is all about prophecy. Okay, here we go. In Isaiah 52, 13 says this, See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up. Hint. Okay. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. Uh, crucifixion was not yet invented. But we know that Jesus was beaten up severely. If you know what happened to crucifixion and the cat of nine tails and all the things that took place, Jesus was ripped apart by flesh, right? So his face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows. Acquainted with the deepest grief. My God, my God, right? He was crying in the wall. He was crying in the garden where the Bible says it was like his blood. He was sweating blood. He was under so much duress. His capillaries were breaking and mixing with his sweat glands. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed up down on him. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. A punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. It's a sacrificial lamb, right? He was whipped so we could be healed by his stripes. We are healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. The Bible says there's not one righteous, no, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We have left God's path to follow our own. The moment you follow your own path is the moment you are following Satan. You're following the devil. It's either God or the devil. You can't live for yourself. The moment you live for yourself, you're living for the enemy. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. You know what happened in the wilderness? They were rebelling against Moses, and God sent snakes, and the people were getting killed by the snakes. He, and he said, Moses, make a pole, put a snake on it, uh, you know, a gold a, a snake, like a, not a real snake, but a, um, what do you call it, an idol of a snake, an image of a snake, and lift it up. And when the, and we lifted the pole up, what happened? People saw the curse of the snake, and the curse that was upon them went on that snake, and it stopped. Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the snake of the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. He was lifted up on, the, on Golgotha, that all of our sins were put upon him. If you and I will look up to Jesus and put our faith in that, the plague of our sin goes upon Christ, and you and I are freed from our sins. Now, how on earth did Jesus make that happen? Can you see how the, the scriptures work together like that? So he was oppressed the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and, and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in the midstream. What did it say in Daniel? In midstream, he was cut off. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. Now check this out. He was put in a rich man's grave. Jesus was put in a borrowed tomb for three days. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering, for sin, he's an offering for sin. He will have many descendants. That's why we're here today, everybody. We're descendants of Christ, if you gave him life to Christ. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear 
all their sin. How much clearer can you get? That's written 600 to 700 years before Christ even came. It describes exactly what Jesus did. How could you make that happen on your own? The Bible is very clear. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. Jesus was that sacrifice, and he's coming again. Are you right with God? This is serious. This is true. This is not made up. This is not some good feel religion. This is true. How can you make this happen? I will give him the honors of victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. My God, my God. Isn't that amazing, everybody? I think it's amazing. I didn't have time to show you the math today of how all that worked out in regards to the seven sets of 70 and all that. I could put something on the internet for that. I didn't have time to break that down today. But this is the truth, everybody. I read this a number of years ago, and I think it's really good. If God perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent an economist. If he'd perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or artist. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political stability, he would have sent us a politician. If he had perceived our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death. So he sent a Savior. And he's coming again. And as we celebrate this Passion Week, let us remember what Christ did. And let us remember that he rose again from the dead. And because he rose again, so can you and I. But you must put your faith in him. Listen, everybody, this is not just some religious thing we believe. We're believing the truth. There's no religion in the world that can even come close to the Bible. There's so many prophecies. It's absolutely astounding. How can you not believe? How can you not believe? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for today, and I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Jesus, that you have fulfilled Scripture and that we're believing you for the complete fulfillment of Scripture. But, Lord, we want to remember the reason you came is because you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to take our place, that if we put our faith in you and give our lives to you, we will not perish but of everlasting life. And Father, not only that, but you sent us. The reason we're here is to make a difference in the world by spreading your good news. Lord, forgive us for being so distracted with our own ideals. Lord, like the Pharisees of old, we're distracted with our own Christianity. We're distracted with our own church gatherings that we've forgotten our purpose is to spread your good news. So, Father, I pray for an inauguration a that we be deputized, oh God, to be bold for you, that we be humble and bold, and that we would share your word to a world that needs to hear that you are coming again. Father, bless us today in Jesus' name. And, Father, Holy Spirit, I pray you touch every single person right now and move in their hearts in Jesus' name.